Chapter 1 When I return, I'll bring you back a gold mirror and a gold comb, little cat. Would you like that? Gunhild's father stroked her forehead as he sat on the edge of her bed. There are fortresses in England and buildings of marble, he said. They have gold candlesticks and books with jewels on the cover. We'll be rich. Gunhild smiled up at her father. She loved seeing him this happy. Sometimes at bedtime he told her stories of gods and giants and dwarves, but lately he had been telling her of all the things he had heard about England and its cities full of treasure and the long sleek ship with the red and white sail that he and his brother Ragnolf would sail on. Now go to sleep, little cat, he said, and she rolled over and pulled her blanket around her shoulders. Her father stood and looked around the big house lit by the fire's embers. He smiled at his wife, Thorvi, and put his arms around her. She continued tidying and didn't smile back. She always grew quiet whenever he would talk about England and his plan with Ragnall. I'll be back at the end of the summer, he whispered in her ear. Only the gods can say, she murmured, and continued tidying. As Gunhild lay with her eyes closed, she listened to the others in the house already asleep, her little brother and her Aunt Inga. Cows in the attached barn shuffled their feet, the fire crackled quietly. As she drifted off, she imagined what it would be like to ride a ship across the waves, spray splashing against her, gulls circling above. At twelve years old, she had never been out on the ocean, but promised herself she would one day. She awoke to daylight. Though it was spring, the morning was chilly, and Gunhild wrapped a shawl around her as she went outside to the latrine fifty yards from the house. Her house was long and rectangular, with a pitched roof covered by thatch. Smoke from the fireplace curled from a hole at the top. There were few windows and no glass. It was home to her father, mother, aunt, brother, and herself in one large room. Attached to the house was a barn for four cows. It was the only house for a mile in any direction. She knew all the other families on nearby farms and visited them often, but there were times when she would go for days without seeing anyone outside her family, without leaving the small farm she had known all her life. When she came back inside, her mother was cooking porridge over the fire. Her father was already gone, probably milking the cows. The fire was on a high stone hearth in the middle of the house, and the iron pot for the porridge hung above it. Around the edge of the house were beds and baskets and boxes that held everything anyone needed. Many baskets were full of wool waiting to be spun, or yarn waiting to be woven, or the cloth that came of it. Her mother's loom stood in one corner. The windows were small and shuttered in the morning, so there wasn't much light. Gunhild sat next to her aunt and her brother, also eating their breakfasts. "'Good morning, Aunt Inga,' she said. "'Good morning,' smiled her aunt. "'Gunny,' said her brother Wolf, "'I'm a bear. This is my bear porridge,' he roared happily as he ate. "'Gunny, when you're done, I'll need some more water from the creek,' said her mother. "'Take Rolf with you.' "'No, mother, I'm a bear,' said Rolf. Take the bear, then, said her mother. Also, Freudus is going to come today, so wash your face when we have some hot water. She looked at Rolf, spooning porridge into his mouth with more enthusiasm than accuracy. And wash the bear's face, too. Gunhild took two buckets, and Rolf followed behind with one. They walked past the garden, where shoots of onions and cabbage were beginning to peek above the soil. They had planted peas the week before, and green tendrils would soon wind around the trellises. Past the garden was the fenced-off field where the barley was beginning to sprout. Another fenced field was the cow pasture. Past that and downhill a bit was a creek surrounded by trees. Gunhild and Rolf followed the well-worn path to the stream bank, and Rolf chattered. Pretend that I'm your bear, and you found me in the woods, and you took me home, and only you can understand me, because you speak bear, but no one else speaks bear, so I come home with you. Most of Gunhild's day was spent working, but it wasn't drudgery, and she couldn't imagine not working while her mother, father, and aunt tended cows, grew barley, spun yarn, wove cloth, and sewed clothes. Her father was constantly repairing things or helping a neighbor. Even Rolf tried to help chop firewood, though he wasn't very good at it. By the time she had gotten herself and Rolf cleaned up with warm water and a rag, her mother and aunt were already sitting and spinning together. There were no sheep on the farm, 
but they got wool from Freudus, who lived on a neighboring farm. She often delivered raw wool and picked up finished cloth, which she sold at the market in the town of Ripa, near the ocean. Gunhild had been to Ripa before, and seen all the people who came through on their ships, selling things from far away. Sometimes Frisians came, selling beads, knives, even cups made of glass, and loading up on furs and walrus ivory from the north to take back with them. And Inga was humming as the children walked in. In one hand she held a distaff, a short stick with a roll of raw wool around it. She used her free hand to pull away a long strand of wool, from which hung a stick with a stone weight on it. This was the spindle. Aunt Inga spun the spindle, and the wool twisted into yarn. Every so often she would wrap up the yarn on the spindle, tease out more wool, and spin it again. Her mother did the same, sitting on a stool nearby, her hands so practiced that she hardly had to think about it. Aunt Inga's humming changed to a song. Dog sits by the fire's side, old crow now to him does fly. Have you food for me, dog, have you food for me? Fly away, crow, from this hall, you shall have no food at all. Go seek past the garden wall, ask no food from me. Pick apart some wool for us, would you, Gunhild? asked her mother. Can I pick two? asked Rolf. No, child, go find your father. Go play outside. Rolf took a carved wooden horse, one of his favorite toys, and made it gallop out of the house. Gunhild picked up a handful of fleece and began to pick it apart, shaking loose bits of dirt or hay, teasing out the knots. Inga sang another verse, then trailed off, and the two women and the girl sat for a while lost in their thoughts and in their wool. Mother, asked Gunhild, when is father leaving? Her mother's face darkened. When Ragnolf arrives? He said it would be around the full moon, but he's not certain. Does he need to fix the ship first? I don't know. I never know with Ragnolf. He just shows up with an idea or makes some plan and you never know. She stopped, aware that she was coming a little too close to speaking ill of her brother-in-law. Do you think there will be any Jarls or Huskarls on the ship with him? Gunhild had never met a Jarl, one of the powerful and wealthy men who owned large halls, great ships, or vast farms, and who had their own personal guards or Huskarls. I certainly don't know, her mother said icily and Gunhild could tell that she shouldn't ask about the trip any more. Gunhild's father, Kettle, had milked the cows already and put them to pasture. After that, he had walked once around the barley field, checking the fence. It looked sturdy for the moment, but he decided to split some more logs in case it needed repair in the future. Kettle had farmed all his life, as had his own father, and he felt deep in his bones the need to be prepared for the future, whatever may come. As he thought of this, and then his plan to leave soon, he felt another jolt of anxiety. Though he would never let on to his family, the trip with Ragnolf filled him with both excitement and fear. They would go viking, raiding across the sea. He would fight hand to hand with fierce warriors, he who had never been in more than a fist fight. This winter past, his brother came to him and told him that Jarl Thorstein was gathering a crew. Ragnolf had worked for him as a builder for one season and impressed him. Once, one of Thorstein's Huskarls called Ragnolf stupid after he lost at a board game, and Ragnolf went at him with a hammer. It was hammer against sword, and Ragnolf won. Thorstein had later asked Ragnolf to come with him on a raid, and Ragnolf, always looking out for his younger brother, asked to bring Kettle. If they were successful, they could return with money and honor. If not, of course, they could end up dead on an English beach or sunk to the bottom of the sea. The thought chilled Kettle. He murmured to himself as he swung the mallet to split the rail. A life may ebb, a life may end, and soon even friends forget. But men who are known by mighty deeds pass on but never perish. It was one of his favorite verses, a piece of folk wisdom passed from person to person. Kettle loved poetry as he loved his land. He had learned to love both from his father. Rolf ran out of the house and up to him. Can I split the logs? he asked. His father smiled. Rolf would probably do no more than dent the wood, but Kettle loved it when Rolf tried to do grown-up things. He handed Rolf the mallet and watched his son do his best to lift it. Gunhild's father was well-muscled from a lifetime of work. In his mid-thirties now, he wore his blonde hair short 
and kept his beard trimmed. His wife, however, was brown-haired and tended toward plumpness, and Gunhild took after her. She stood almost as tall as her mother now. Both had round faces and bright smiles. They were from the class of Danes known as Carls, the wide band of freemen between the nobles and the slaves. They came from farmers and carpenters, weavers and brewers, but Gunhild knew her father took extra pride in owning his own land. Not every man could say that. Still they dressed and lived simply. Gunhild, her mother, and her aunt wore long woolen dresses over the top of a linen underdress. Gunhild kept her hair in a braid. The older women wrapped theirs in a headscarf. Her mother had little jewelry, only a bronze brooch at each of her shoulders attaching the straps of her dress, and a silver ring Kettle had given her. She didn't usually wear the ring, but kept it in a box under her bed with her combs. Kettle and Rolf wore woolen tunics and pants over linen undershirts with belts at their hips. Gunhild's mother and aunt had sewn everything the family wore, and they wove much of it too, including the cloaks, blankets, shawls, and warm hats for the winter. Despite that, they weren't on their own. The whole family was part of a web of farms, towns, and even faraway cities where wool and cloth, fur and ivory, dried fish, iron tools, pots, lamp oil, copper and amber were traded up and down the coasts, rivers, and roads. More than that, they were Danes, and though they didn't have much in the way of a government, they had laws, traditions, and a language that let them know they belonged. Some Danes had journeyed as far as Paris or Rome, but Gunhild had never gone farther than a few days' travel from her farm. Still, she had heard stories of other places and peoples, Swedes and Norwegians to the north, Slavs to the east, and Franks and Frisians to the south. West across the sea were English, Picts, and Gaels, strange people with strange languages and strange gods. Gunhild was churning butter and watching Cappy, the black cat, stalk something in the garden. Cappy came and went as he pleased, and he never got too near any people, but he sometimes would be content to sit near Gunhild and not run away. He had arrived at the farm when Gunhild was eight, and Gunhild spent weeks trying to tame him. Cappy paused and seemed to suddenly change his mind about stalking. Instead, he sat and began to clean himself. "'Are you hanging around waiting for the butter, Cappy?' Gunhild asked. "'This isn't for you, you know.' She lifted the plunger up and down, churning the milk her father had collected that morning. Cappy glanced briefly, as if to imply that he was not at all interested in the butter, when Rolf came running around the side of the house, waving a wooden sword. Cappy dashed off and hid. "'Gunny, I'm Thor!' said Rolf. I'm fighting fire giants and frost giants. Who are you? Thor has a hammer called lightning. The dwarves made it for him. If you have a sword, you should be Tur. I can be Thor with a sword, said Rolf confidently. Tur was very brave, said Gunnhild, when the gods had to trap the great wolf Fenrir by tricking him into wearing the magic chain, Fenrir said that one of them would have to put a hand in his mouth to make sure they would release him afterward. Tudor said that he would do it, even though he knew that as soon as Finrir sensed the trick he would bite off his hand, but he did it anyway, because Finrir was too dangerous to go free. Rolf considered this, then pulled one arm slightly back into a sleeve to hide his hand. Okay, he said, I'm Tudor. Who are you? I'm Freya, said Gunhild. She pretended to hear a sound. What's that? Heimdall is blowing his horn. Rolf perked up like a terrier. The giants approach the walls of Osgarth. Tur, Thor, Odin, Allfather, prepare for battle! Rolf, bubbling with excitement, raised his sword and charged the imaginary giants. As he ran through the meadow, Gunhild heard a rattling in the distance. She took a moment to pause from the butter churn and wipe her brow with the back of her hand. Mother, I think Freudus is here. Gunhild continued to watch as a horse and a cart appeared down the track in the distance. On it sat a woman, older than Gunhild's mother, with gray hair bound back in a headscarf. Her mother came out into the yard where Gunhild stood at the butter churn. Is the butter finished? Not quite, mother. Keep at it, said her mother. We should give some to Freudus before she goes. Freudus, she called. Welcome, welcome. Freudus's horse was old and slow. Still, it must be so useful to have one, thought Gunhild. Horses were expensive and hard to maintain. Gunhild stroked the old horse's nose as it came to a stop, then kissed Freudus on the cheek as she climbed down from the cart. 
Good day, Gunny dear, said Freudus. Get the things, will you? She followed Gunhild's mother inside, and they began to laugh and chat. Gunhild sighed and began to unload the raw wool, a box of salt, some dried fish, and some cheese. She knew that Freudus would pick up raw milk and butter from them, and many hanks of yarn. First, though, she would have some food and conversation. Rolf! yelled Gunhild. She waited. Sorry, Tur! Rolf stuck his head around the corner of the house. Could you use your legendary strength to help unload these fish for the feasting tables of Valhol? Rolf considered. I still have some giants to fight, he said. Gunhild sighed again and picked up a bale of wool, muttering that she wouldn't mind a giant if he would help with the chores. When Gunhild had finished, she went inside, where the three ladies were still chatting happily. Gunhild's mother and aunt had started cooking dinner, and Freudus was telling them a funny story about a farmer who didn't know his runes well. He was worried about someone stealing his pig when he took it to market, so he wrote his name on it in charcoal. Instead of writing his name, Hrolf, he wrote Hross, or horse, and everyone thought he was a fool. "'You know your runes, right, Gunhild?' asked Freudus. "'I do,' she said. Mother and father both taught me. Good, said Freudus. This summer, come visit me, Gunhild. Stay with me for a while. I want to show you my beehives. In fact, I have something for you. She took a clay pot from her bag and removed the lid. Honeycomb. For me, said Gunhild, smiling. Her glance around the room to see if her brother was there gave away her meaning. Save some for Rolf, her mother said. And now I must go, said Freudus, standing. Thorvi, Inga, it's been lovely. She walked slowly, leaning forward slightly and shuffling toward the door. Gunhild jumped up and opened the door for her, and froze when she saw someone striding toward the door in the waning light. Mother, she called. The figure was a large man, closing quickly on the house. He wore a cloak over his tunic and had a sword hanging from his belt. Freudus and Gunhild stood in the doorway and watched him approach. Something about the way the man moved, as if he would knock over anything that stood in his way, made her want to slam the door and lock it. The man walked up to her and stopped. You've grown, he said, after a brief pause. Well, get your father. Uncle Ragnolf? Has it been that long, child? said Ragnolf, unsmiling. He was the same height as her father, but his red-brown hair was shorter and cropped close around the sides and back. Around his neck hung a silver pendant in the shape of an animal all twisted up on itself. Come in, said Gunhild, stepping out of the way. Freudus eyed Ragnolf warily, then once he had passed, left without a word. Gunhild's mother didn't smile either, but kept a level voice as she said, Welcome, Ragnolf. We're just making dinner. Ragnolf might have replied, but Kettle burst through the door behind him. Brother, he shouted and threw his arms around him. Sit down, tell us about your journey from Ripa. Thorvi, put more fish in the stew pot. Thorvi was already doing exactly that, but she didn't say anything. Ragnolf walked across the room to Inga, who stayed sitting. Sister, he said, putting a hand on her shoulder. You were well? Yes, thank the gods, she said, clasping his hand. Welcome home. As dinner cooked, the family sat around the central hearth. Inga and Thorvi tended the fish stew and barley bread, and Gunhild's father, excited and curious, tried to get her uncle to talk, but Ragnolf seemed uninterested in chatting. At one point, he cut off Kettle almost in mid-sentence and said, What do you have for weapons? Kettle looked sheepish. I've never had any. Mm. You'll need to get at least a spear and a shield. A sword and a helmet would be good if you can afford it. Actually, you could just take your axe. Some of the Jarl's men prefer axes. Do you have any money? Kettle seemed a mix of admiration and embarrassment, happy his older brother was taking such an interest, but wishing he had better answers. I have some, he said, but Thorvi will need it for the summer. Ragnolf frowned. You know what? Kettle interjected quickly. I'll take a cow with us and sell it when we get to Ripa. That should pay for something. Gunhild noticed his mother's eyes widen at this announcement, but she said nothing. Ragnolf nodded and began to talk about Jarl Thorstein's men, and which freemen had been asked to come on the raid. Kettle listened attentively. Thorvi served dinner, 
and they ate seated around the hearth, holding wooden bowls and wooden spoons above their laps. When you return, brother, you'll eat with silver, commented Ragnolf. Kettle smiled and nodded. More than that, said Kettle, I can finally have a horse. We'll buy more cows, more barley to plant. We can hire some workers to build a new barn. Imagine what this farm could be with a little money. The family kept eating, and Ragnolf and Kettle discussed the voyage and the conditions on the North Sea, and whether the English towns would have soldiers at the ready. Kettle smiled broadly, then paused a moment and looked up in thought. When he spoke next, it was in the rich, alliterative language of poetry. A hearty oar-horse heaves on waves, sea spray surrounds, surging with might. Twelve vulture friends, valiant in victory, bring home glory and bright battle gold. Gunhild could tell he had made it up on the spot. When her father was full of emotion, words came to him, and he could craft his thoughts into pulsing rhythm and repeating sounds. Well said, said Ragnolf, finishing his soup. You always did have a gift for words, little brother. At the compliment, Kettle couldn't help but beam with joy. Ragnolf stayed the night. He took Gunhild's bed, and she crammed in next to Rolf. In the morning, her father and uncle would leave and return in time for the harvest. She hadn't minded before, but now everything seemed too sudden. She wasn't ready. She didn't remember drifting off. When she awoke, her father was already packing. By sunrise, Kettle and Ragnolf had said their goodbyes and parted. Kettle took his hatchet and led away one of the cows. Gunhild thought her mother might argue about that, but she hadn't. It was probably important not to embarrass Kettle in front of his brother, and arguing about a cow would have done exactly that. Besides, how could he go fight without a sword? Neither Gunhild nor her mother cried, but Rolf did. Kettle knelt beside him and told him to be brave and look after his family, and promised to return. You can't promise that, thought Gunhild. Can I go with you next year? asked Rolf. We'll see if you're big enough, smiled his father. Take care, little cat, he said to Gunhild. Then he squeezed her warmly on the shoulder, kissed Thorvi, and walked away. As soon as they were out of sight, Thorvi spoke. So, your father will be gone for twelve weeks or more. That doesn't mean there's less work to do. Gunhild, you'll milk the cows every morning. You might as well get started. Rolf, your new morning job is to weed the garden and the barley field. I don't want to weed the garden, said Rolf. Sometimes what you want doesn't matter, said Thorvi grimly, and she went inside to start cooking. <laughs>